What's up, everybody? My name's Adam McDorman, and this is American Literature. So the time has finally come. We are closing in on the last few days of the school year, and what better way for us to finish than to take a look at one of the most influential American authors of the last 100 years, uh, my personal favorite author of all time, Ray Bradbury. We're going to be reading a short story called The Velt. Now, as always, the best way for us to try to get the most out of this text is to know a little bit about the author's life, a little bit about the historical context that surrounds the story itself, and to finish up by taking a look at a few key literary features of this story and bearing in mind a few big thematic ideas through which we can view this story in order to make sense of it, in order to find the meaning of this text. Let's jump into it. Ray Bradbury lived from 1920 to 2012. He was born in Waukegan, Illinois, which means he's from the Midwest, much like myself. Aside from a few times where he actually lived in Tucson, Arizona, he lived in Illinois until he was about 14 years old, at which time his family moved to Los Angeles, California in 1934. As a youngster, Bradbury was an avid reader. I mean, he read everything from Edgar Allan Poe to Edgar Rice Burroughs, from Mark Twain to pulp novels and comic books. And there was a time in his life where he also went to the movies pretty much every single day. He used to say that he saw every movie that existed. If there was a narrative in pop culture to be engaged with, he was engaging with it. He grew up being captivated by magic tricks, by technology, and the potential of the future. You can kind of see the pattern that he developed in those early formative years bearing itself out in his storytelling. Bradbury was a very observant person. He found inspiration for his imaginative tales all around him. And kind of a result of that is that he didn't like to be classified as a science fiction author, even though we kind of talk about him in those terms to this day. He believed that his stories were deeply human, and they certainly were. Technology exists, they're a major part of his stories, but they're not front and center. They're not the subject of his stories. So you'll see that regardless of how well some of the aesthetic choices of his stories hold up all these years later, the big ideas, the themes, the conflicts that are at the heart of those stories are universal. Bradbury was fascinated with technology and technological advancement, but he often wrote stories that contained warnings about a potential future of some kind problems that might arise from us engaging with what he thought was really fascinating and cool technology, but doing so to our own harm. What would be the negative consequences of whatever invention that he was fascinated with? He mined those fears for interesting story ideas, and that's what makes the best science fiction so powerful and so timeless. Ray Bradbury was a prolific writer. He wrote over 30 books, more than 600 short stories, and over 50 scripts for stage plays, television shows, radios, and even feature films. I happen to have every book he's ever written except for the first one, which is really hard to come by. Maybe not that good, but really expensive. So I'm a, I'm a super fan. A few of his notable works, if you're looking for a place to jump in to Ray Bradbury's amazing and diverse catalog of writing, include The Martian Chronicles from 1950, which is a collection of short stories that are related to one another. And this includes one of his most well-known short stories that's often included in high school curriculum, a short story called There Will Come Soft Rains. Amazing story, uh, not too long. I highly recommend that you read that one if you enjoy the Velt from this week. He wrote The Illustrated Man in 1951. That's another collection of short stories that includes the reading for this week. Fahrenheit 451, which is by far his most popular and well-known novel from 1953, and a really amazing, subtle coming-of-age story called Dandelion Wine, which he published in 1957. Ray Bradbury was such an accomplished author that we could spend a couple of slides talking just about the various awards that he won. 
but a few of the more recognizable ones include the National Merit of Arts that he won in 2004, as well as a special Pulitzer Prize citation that he won in 2007. And of course, Ray Bradbury passed away on June 5th, 2012, at the age of 91. Just a few days before my 27th birthday, actually. So let's talk a little bit about the historical context of this story. The Velt was published on September 23rd, 1950, in an issue of the Saturday Evening Post. I want to point something out here that would probably be lost on most of us because we're so surrounded by modern technology. The Velt was published in 1950, and it wasn't until a little over seven years later, in December 1957, that IBM released their 608 transistor calculator. Now, we think of calculators as these, you know, small devices that we can put in a pocket. The picture that you're seeing on this slide is the IBM 608 transistor calculator. It's about the size of a refrigerator plus like a washing machine. Fast forward 20 years after even that, and we get the first thing that kind of resembles what we think of as a computer. The Apple II was released in June 1977, and it was kind of one of the first consumer grade off the shelf computers that you could buy and take home. And then fast forward another 30 years, so almost 60 years after the publishing of the Velt, and we get the rise of something called the Internet of Things. And you can think of this as the increased popularity of smart technology, devices that are connected to the internet. Things like your voice activated Amazon Alexa, your ring doorbell with a camera built into it, your smart Nest thermostat that controls your temperature automatically, the Netflix recommendations that are supposed to give you something fun to watch without you having to go find it yourself the Roomba vacuum cleaner that cleans your floors without you even thinking about it, and dozens, if not hundreds, of new technologies that make our lives easier, that increase the quality of our living in a way. And that in particular is a really striking feature of Ray Bradbury's story. And that story, at the time of this recording, is almost 70 years old. Old, and we are just now beginning to have the kind of living that Ray Bradbury was predicting all those years ago. So let's take a look at a few literary features of this text and start to pull this whole thing together. One interesting thing about this story is that the children in the story are named Peter and Wendy, which is a literary allusion to Peter Pan. Now remember, allusion is when a story makes reference to another literary text or historical event, historical person, some bit of information outside of the story that is going to carry with it some meaning for the reader. And if you're familiar with the story of Peter Pan, it does contain uh, a bit of meaning that hooks into the story. Much of Peter Pan takes place in this faraway land called Neverland, which is outside of the parents control. There are no adults. That's a place where you go to never grow up. You'll see that at work in this story with these kids wanting to find a place that is outside of the control of their parents, a place where they have the power. In a way, the Velt kind of blurs the line between technology and futurism with magic. There are some events in here that you're supposed to take as kind of fantastical, as kind of magical, beyond the realm of possibility. Ray Bradbury did that with a lot of his stories. He blurred the lines between the possible and the impossible. The Velt is also a very strong example of show, don't tell. This is not a difficult story to read, but Ray Bradbury doesn't come right out and tell you what happens. You have to make that tiny leap to kind of put those pieces together. And that's part of what makes the story so satisfying. Much like you put the pieces together with By the Waters of Babylon by Stephen Vincent Pinay, you have to kind of take a look at what's going on and say, oh, 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 that's what happened? Yikes, that's brutal. And one final thing that I want to touch on here before you jump in and read this story, and that is the fact that the Velt is, is kind of a dated vision of the future. And that is to say that this story is kind of a prediction of the future 
or perhaps even a prediction of our current age from well over 50 years ago. If you're watching this and you're a gamer and maybe you're familiar with the Fallout series of games, you know that that is a prediction of the future through the eyes of someone from the 1950s, right? And what someone would have thought spaceships or laser guns or atomic weapons might look like way back in the 1950s is very different than how we would predict those things now. It's a, a visual sort of thing. It's an aesthetic interpretation. Underneath that, the big themes, the big ideas, the big concepts of the Velt and many of Ray Bradbury's stories are still extremely relevant. So let's talk about some of those big ideas to finish this conversation out. Obviously, one of the first thematic ideas that you're going to encounter in this story is that of technology. Specifically, technology that we become reliant on. This text, even way back in 1950, was asking a question about whether or not we are too reliant on technology. Do our gadgets make us docile? Does the ease of our existence, enabled by many of these technologies, make us too tame? Does it take away from part of what makes us human? That's a valid question. Also, there's the concept of relationship and isolation. You'll see that there is a breakdown in the relationship between the parents and the children in this story. And in some ways, the technology is partially responsible for the erosion of that relationship, right? And so it asks the question, does technology isolate us? That question is more poignant now than ever before. And last but not least, we have the idea of structure versus agency. Major thematic concept of this story. Are the parents failing to provide the necessary structure of boundaries for their children, right? Are the children given too much free agency? and therefore failing to develop some moral character, some thing that is important for their continued development as human beings, which is another fair question that this text is asking. As always, I hope you take the time to read and enjoy this story. I think it's a pretty fun read with quite a surprising and, dare I say, brutal twist at the end. And we'll get together and talk about it very soon. Until then, good luck, have fun, what a time to be alive.